Hello again. This is Jim Hogue, again with Daniel Hecht, and we are talking about novels. The name of this program, which has been the same name for 30-some years, is The House at Pooh Corner. And last time we spoke about the importance of of you and your vocabulary if you're going to sit down and try to write something. And it's not just the words that come to you, because I'm always blocked in that way. I have to know where to go to find the word. The last one was epigraph. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, for the life of me, think of the word <laughs> epigraph. So I, I kept hunting in all these different places. I still couldn't find it. And then finally, it popped up someplace. And I said, wait, that's it. That's the word. So I'm going to read it uh, when I finish my little intro. I'm okay. going to read an epigraph Great. by F. Scott Fitzgerald Excellent. Good choice. in uh, The Great Gatsby. So today we are going to talk, I think, primarily about character and how characters are formed in a novel. And we're going to talk a little bit about what a novel is, because we didn't really get to that last time. And to me, a, the wonderful thing about a novel is that the novelist can go wherever he wants, here, there, and everywhere, but he has to hang his hat on something, especially if it's, if it's a mystery or an adventure of some kind. The, the most important aspect, according to Aristotle, who never heard of a novel, uh, is plot. Because whatever you've got, you're hanging it. You're hanging the character, the theme, the setting, the the music, the poetry, everything. You're hanging it on what this person is trying to accomplish, the, the, which is the plot. So, but today we're going to primarily talk about character, I think, and how the character is created. So uh, there's that. But I want to give a little introduction on what you should probably read if you're interested in knowing the history of American literature and some of the outright history to this country uh, before it's buried somewhere. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, because I think if you are an American and you're going to write an American book, it behooves you to know what came before you. And we have periods in this country. We have the Enlightenment from the 18th century. We have the um, Transcendentalism from the 19th century and the Romantic period, on and on and on. So those are the kinds of things that you might want to be looking into as you uh, follow through your education. Um, but I wanted to mention some of the books that you should read. Uh, the first two are not novels because the first American novel came a little later than that. The first two, Two Years Before the Mast by Richard Henry Dana, and The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman. Uh, these are journals. Uh, the first no actual novel that I can think of, and um, I think Daniel will have something to say about this sort of thing when, when he gets the floor. Uh, the first novel that I can think of is The Scarlet Letter, which you absolutely must read, um, since it's the first American novel. It's written in a European style, in my opinion, but it's the first actual novel written in, uh, in this country. So moving on from that, the first American novel that is written in an American style that was that made the American style sort of jump off the page. And everybody else said, wow, you can do that. That's a Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. And then there was another great author of that period who wrote with primarily a European style, but he was American, lived in England. And that was uh, Henry James. And one of my favorite books by him, and I've read several. My mother loved reading Henry James. Uh, was Portrait of a Lady. I just adored that book. Um, and there are two other books about women that I put in a, a, a trio. There's Anna Karenia, oh, yeah. uh, Tolstoy, and there's Flaubert, Madame okay. Bovary. Right. Um, but anyway, um, Portrait of a Lady is one of those three great books. 
Uh, okay, then moving on, there's The Jungle by uh, Sinclair Lewis, which I mentioned because it tells you a tremendous amount about America, about what America was like at the time. And another author who does that is John Steinbeck, by the way, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, mm, for example. Yeah. I, was, I was in that dramatization <laughs> with the Ice Fire Theater. Um, then two books that actually made me cry as I was reading them, uh, O Pioneers and um, My Antonia by Willa Cather. I just was so, they were so compelling because the characters were so human and, and lovable. Uh, anyway, so those, those two books, O Pioneers and My Antonia, and then right up to Into the Modern Writers, we have A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway and The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I wanted to read you the first paragraph of A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway, you can read, you know, everybody's written about Hemingway. It's just the, the kind of writer that everybody seems to want to write about one way or another. And there was uh, one woman, woman critic who said this is the most beautifully written first paragraph in, in literature, mm. which I, I mentioned it was a woman because there have been a slew of women who went after Hemingway. Right. Well, for, he is pretty misogynistic, and his women are defined very narrowly, but he was people, of a and I had, and an error. I'd error. never thought of it as misogynistic yeah. myself. Um, but there's, a, there's almost an irrelevance mm -hmm. to women in, in some of his yeah. books. Um, and, and I've read almost all of them, and I've, I've loved most of them, but not all of them. Some I thought were a little tedious. But this book is pure poetry all the way through. And so here's the first paragraph. And it, it's, you described Hemingway last week, too. And this is, is fitting of that. I don't consider it in the least bit masculine, but I consider it compelling in the way one word inevitably right. follows the next. Okay. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising, and leaves stirred by the breeze falling, and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. So, not a, not a highfalutin phrase in there. No, but look at, there's some stylistic things. Mm -hmm. I went through a big Hemingway period when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read every, every book from first to last, and I saw the development of his stuff. But if you look at that, look at the rhythm of the and, the yep. such and such, and the such and yep. such, and the such and such. Mm -hmm. And there are those troops marching, row upon row upon row. It's very artistically done, but you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is co concealing in plain speech, rather clever artifice, rather you know, art. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, Hemingway blew me away. He was so lean and sinewy, maybe mm -hmm. too lean and sinewy. But you know, when he said he walked down the hill, the sun was setting behind the mountains. It was very satisfactory. Well, <laughs> it's not going to be much going, but I can totally be, I'm totally there. It's uh -huh. so amazing. How does he do it? It's like magic, you mm -hmm. know? So once again, there's a, there is deep art built into what appears to be very plain speech. Yeah. yeah. That he w wrote like a poem. Yeah. I mean, he thought like a poet, I think, when he yeah. sat down at the cafe in yeah. Paris yeah. And, and wrote this. Yeah. So now I want to mention uh, the the epi epic <laughs> epigraph in the, in the Great Gatsby, um, because when you write a novel, you have to make a decision 
as to whether or not you're going to put some little thing at the beginning, whatever it is, a prologue, which could be several pages, or somebody else might write a prologue for you. Um, but I'm talking about something that you write that, or maybe a famous quote that somebody else wrote, that you may or may not want to put at the beginning of your book. And this is the magnificent little piece that Fitzgerald wrote, and he put in the beginning of his book. But here's a secret that most people don't know. He gives another name. He gives the name Thomas Park d'Anvilliers to this. Well, isn't that the, who, he's, who he's quoting? No. Oh. He wrote it. Oh, OK. And he has a character. OK. Uh, he has used that character in the past. Oh, no, so I Thomas did that Park. in my, my second novel, believe it or not. I made mm -hmm. up a, a, a character who features in the novel, and I quoted him in, in one of my epigraphs. Okay. That is so cool. I didn't know anybody had done it. I assumed uh -huh. that there was some, some guy mm -hmm. I'd never and, heard of. And I sent you a little joke-like kind of thing that I do in, uh -huh. in my book where I comment that. Anyway, Thomas Park Danvilliers is not only a pseudonym huh. for um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, but he's also a character in the book, but he's a pseudonym for a character mm -hmm. in the book. Right who was out of Dickens. <laughs> so those are my little conceits. Those right. are my literary conceits mm -hmm. that anybody with what we call, what we used to call a well-rounded literary education would, would, would get that. But I, luckily, I had an English teacher who was a very good English teacher and knew a lot. And I think I might have been on the tail end of the American schooling system, which taught that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, I, I was at um, a party several years ago, attended by a lot of literary, I won't call them literary types, but they were theater types, people who supposedly knew a lot. I read, um, I, I said, I'm going to read you something, and I'm going to see whether or not you know what it's from. Uh -huh. So I read the first paragraph. Of the farewell to arms. Right, pretty famous N paragraph. Nobody uh -huh. there knew that it was the first paragraph from the farewell to arms. Oh, wow. And um, of course, as a high school teacher, I taught this every year okay. that I taught American Lit. So I've read it several times. Right. Um, so, but that's probably why it's and and my I read a lot of crit criticism. So th that's why that paragraph sticks in my head. But it was hard for me to believe that I think I would have recognized it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've read Huckleberry Finn maybe two or three times, and I think you could read anything. You could right. pick anything out of that book and read it, and I would know that it came from Huckleberry Finn. Right. But anyway, here's the little quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he credits his character, Thomas Park d'Anvilliers, for having written it. Then wear the gold hat, if that will move her. If you can bounce high, bounce for her too. Till she cry, lover, gold-hatted, high-bouncing lover, I must have you. And that's the plot hmm. of this book, is Gatsby trying to get um, Daisy, hmm. trying to get Daisy back. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've written eight novels, and I have I have uh, epigraphs in each one. And mm. I, it is a task that I sometimes love and sometimes hate mm. coming up with that epigraph. And I often, a couple of them are are just like, in a sense, they're the summary of what the whole book is about mm -hmm. in a matter of two sentences or something. Yeah. Uh, usually I usually try to find some notable figure. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's obscure, or a quote from a psychology book. But... Um, Novels begin in a lot of different ways. You can have big views, you know, you can have in the moment, in medias race, starting in the moment, shots rang out from the tree, you know, this guy. Yeah. He felt a bullet, you know. Doc Taro. Or, and in that case, often you want to say, what is this novel about? So I go to theme, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Theme is sort of the, uh, a philosophical premise or underlying moral comment that the book will essay to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and often I try to encapsulate that in a telling few words in the epigraph so that readers, everything that the reader reads presumably come through the filter of that initial thing. They'll mm -hmm. forget about it, but it'll still you know, color it. It'll take mm -hmm. like, you know, drops of uh, food coloring in water. It'll slightly color it. So mm. yeah, epigraphs, what fun. Yeah. And you've got to find the right one or people just ignore it. Yeah. All, all together, they don't, they don't get it. Th this one is kind of, um, I don't know, otherworldly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I love that. Mm. So that's my advice to you up through The Great Gatsby. I have stopped <laughs> there because we could go on and you know, talk about other great books that have been written since The Great Gatsby, and there have been many of them. But uh, I... I want to stop there because, and, and you know, if if you can replay this interview, people can go back and and, and catch these books right. and what we've we've said about them, um, and uh, otherwise we can. I'll turn it over to you, and we can start talking about character or not. Oh, there were a couple of metaphors I wanted to. Oh, good. Yeah. We talked about metaphors, um, and I think off camera. I, I said, if you're a director, you don't want to just tell your actor, well, you're explaining this thing. You're, you're explaining when you have to get there, you're explaining how to, you know. You, that doesn't help the actor. You want to give them a metaphor. So, and I, I use the example, burning the words in. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm a director and I say to the actor, uh, you're burning the words into her head, that helps the actor, because it gives the actor something to see, it's visual and something to feel. But if I just say you're explaining something, which is like 99% of what right. directors would do, then it's the actor's job, and that's what I've been trained to do as an actor. You have to find your own metaphor to make it work. Otherwise, it's kind of just lies there. Um, now, let's say it's bad news. Let, let's say that, um, you know, you're, you have to tell your mother that your brother was just killed. So the, you're certainly not going to burn the words into her head. You're, you're going to sugarcoat it. You're going to coat it with honey. So that's what the director needs to tell the actor to help the actor along with a metaphor. And then if you're listening, you don't, the, if the director just says you're listening, that doesn't, doesn't do anything. But if you say you're hanging on his lips, that's a metaphor from the importance of being earnest. Mm. Uh, that really gives you something to look at and to, to feel and to, and to see. And the song, Honeysuckle Rose, uh, Fats Waller, it's full of these wonderful metaphors mm. like that. Um, so hanging on his lips is one. Drinking it in is another one. Memorizing, if, if you're just listening, it could be anything. But if you're memorizing what the person is saying, then there's an intensity, or what we call in theater, an investment on the part of your character in what's going on. So you should be thinking about that a little bit as you write. Do you want to write um, that Bill was explaining this to Sally? Which is fine if you, if you don't want the reader to pay much attention to that word. But if you want the reader to learn something about Bill, then you might say, and Bill was burning it into her head that she's got to get there at 3 o'clock. It shows you what Bill is like. It tells you something about Bill. If you just say Bill was explaining to her, you, you learn nothing about Bill. Right. So off we go. <laughs> Where to? <laughs> I don't know, a lot of places to go from it. Well, you know, uh, there are a lot of techniques for dealing with character. I think that characterization is the... The most important thing you can do as a novelist um, is to write compelling characters. But how do you write compelling characters? You can't just describe them as virtuous or they do this or that. Or they, uh, were, they were all state quarterback on their high school football team. Yeah, okay, it's virtues. Um, it is, in fact, through a whole range of techniques, I guess you'd call them, or approaches that you make compelling characters. 
Um, I don't know if you can make it as too much of a science. I tend to be an analytical type guy, so I write this stuff down for my own reference. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's here's a cool. And because I've taught it, you know, college advanced fiction stuff, I um, classes. I try to write these essays that tell about character. I didn't particularly prepare any notes on character for today, but uh, what I did was I thought about American literature. Well, why don't we do that now, and okay. we can come back if well, we have time to the character. I can, I can or actually distill, mix them together. I distill a few things from yeah. from the progression of American literature. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, when you were talking about oh the foundations of American literature, I went back to captivity narratives. I don't mm. know if you about that. There's a whole period when mm. Ethan yeah, Allen, everybody mm. wanted to read about. Mainly women, though, kidnapped by American Indian, mm -hmm. Native Americans. The most important one was Mary Rowlandson's narrative. It was printed in 1682. Um, and it was interesting. Uh, it's a, uh, it was reprinted nine times between 1770 and 1776, mm -hmm. almost 100 years later. Why is that? Uh, because it was also a nice metaphor for liberation from the British. Mm -hmm. uh, was, what happens is in these captivity narratives in early America, uh, you have to remember there are white people coming in and taking Indians' land and stuff, and the Indians, when they fought back, would sometimes take prisoners, and sometimes they were women, mm -hmm. and then they were captives for however long it was. In Mary Rowland's case, it was 11 weeks, mm -hmm. which can you know, be a long time among strangers, and you don't speak the language. But um, interestingly, uh, they... Uh, you know, three parts is the attack and the capture, then there's the suffering and trials, and then finally there's the return and the transformation. Usually it has a Christian thing, a motif to it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, there were a whole series of uh, progression of, of writers. Some of them were novelists and some were early on, like Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who was born in 1809, died in 49. Mm -hmm. um, his first publication was 1833. Uh, he was a huge figure, not just that he was the father of the mystery genre and, and sort of the mm -hmm. horror genre as well, but also um, uh, he consciously was not European in style. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be more naturalistic and stuff. In fact, he got into a big, uh, a big brouhaha with a very famous American poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, and it was actually called the Longfellow Wars. Hmm. And he just hated his poetry, he said. He called his era the heresy of the didactic. <laughs> and he considers his worth, work preachy and derivative. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, you know, he, he saw America departing from continental styles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and Longfellow, he said to Longfellow, we, we grant him high qualities, but deny him the future. <laughs> Oh, hmm. Ouch! You know, and sure enough, we, we read a lot yeah. of Poe nowadays, and then we do a long ago. But anyway, you go through uh, another one, of course, Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. an amazing book, The Scarlet Letter. He was really an artist, an artistic writer, deep mm -hmm. themes, deep, you know. But he was still pretty European sounding. Then Melville came along, and he was a little mm -hmm. less European, and so on. And we move forward to, to eventually, I think we see the fulfillment of early American literature in Mark Twain, as you point out. He mm -hmm. is finally free from the last constraint of the continental style. Mm -hmm. So, but going back to character, one of the trends, the progressions, the er American literature early on was focused on landscape, Native Americans, hardihood, uh, you know, bra focused on often brash, pioneering characters. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there was also a, a simultaneous move, oddly enough, toward what I would call interiority. Uh, you see in, um, uh, especially when you get to Henry James, who was born in 1843, you see this focus on the psychology of the individual. Yeah, and Hawthorne did that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and they were, but they were expository. That is mm -hmm. to say, the narrator, the author, would say, he was a sensitive fellow who had, you know, suffered under his father's hard discipline, and later in life, you know, he would. The mm -hmm. narrator is telling you this, right? Mm -hmm. That's a terrible way to get a character across. You can tell me all, you know, all the data on you. I could download my computer might want to read through it, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to know is how you express yourself, what you look like, how you move. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I yeah. will get you better yeah. as, uh, if I'm sitting in the audience and you're on stage. Don't download your bio to me. You know, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna act your character. You're gonna be your character. And similarly, mm -hmm. the novelist is charged with 
making the character come alive on the page. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, thanks to Flaubert, French, great French novelist, Madame Bovary, mm -hmm. uh, he invented or pioneered a style called the in free indirect style, mm -hmm. which is what used to be the narrator telling you stuff. He did this, he felt that, he, you know, I mean, no, he, the, the, this happened, the, uh, oh, historical references, the city had, uh, it was originally an agricultural town, but then it grew into a major uh, uh, industrial uh, force. Okay, that's the narrator telling you this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the character would say, too bad the farmers didn't come to you know, Birmingham anymore. Now the factory, you know, mm -hmm. he couldn't, the smell of the factories, you know. For, yeah. So the character's okay. owning this text. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would call moving from the axiomatic narrator. Just there's supposed to be a narrator. Mm -hmm. we, books have narrators. They tell you the story. Duh. No, modern literature increasingly, thanks to American writers like Twain and others, uh, move to what I would call character proprietary. The text is actually the character's thoughts or sensations or experiences mm -hmm. or opinions. Um, and that's been a wonderful way uh, to uh, bring forward character mm -hmm. um, because it's in all the text. What words do you use? Well, those words are actually your, your character's vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the voice of the character is reflected in the narratorial voice. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one of the techniques, of a subtler aspect of, of how to develop character and how character emerges on the page. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I just wanted to yeah. anchor well, one it. Of, one of the great um, compliments that I had from the book, by the way, my publisher, Yeah. His town's gone. What? His town is oh, no. basically gone because of Helen. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Yeah, North Carolina. Oh, my God. Yeah. It, everything's blowing up because of yeah. the salt water getting into the AI stuff. And it's, anyway, um, <laughs> I just thought of that. Uh, the, the guy reading my book said that he learns so much about the character because of conversations mm -hmm, that right. the character has with somebody else, sure. and of course by what the character does. And it partly because I just didn't feel like long descriptions about right. the character, but also because I knew that if I could do it through action right. and conversation, that would be much more interesting and I'd get everything accomplished that way. Yeah, of course. Well, that's good. I, here's another technique I like to use, mm -hmm. uh, what I call a definitive gesture. Mm -hmm. This is to say, um, when you first see, early on when you meet a character, and it could be a minor character, mm -hmm. uh, but you see, uh, by gesture I don't mean, you know, giving somebody the finger or raising yeah. fists. I don't mean that. I mean a, a, an interactive, interaction, interacting with an in, the mm -hmm. environment or with another, another character in the book. How, how do you characterize this person through that, dis that definitive gesture, you distill their essence into perhaps an, a small act of charity. Mm -hmm. In uh, one of my novels called City of Masks, we have the main character whose name is Cree Black. Uh, she's interviewing a woman who's very distraught, and mm -hmm. she's trying to serve tea, and, and as she's doing, the, the, the ring of the teacup snaps off in her hands, he's just too upset the woman is. Mm -hmm. And just at that moment, uh, the the other character's husband comes in mm -hmm. and Cree says, hello, Mr. So-and-so, I'm Cree Black. I'm sorry, I've been a bit of bull of a, in a china shop here. Look, I've broken your teacup. She takes blame for the breaking mm -hmm. of the teacup to, on herself, not mm -hmm. to, to sort of protect the, the wife's uh, discombobulation mm -hmm. from her husband. Uh, and so I think we then see Cree through that definitive gesture yeah. thereafter, a deeply compassionate, uh, character sensitive to nuance of that sort. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that's one of a zillion examples that one could give, you know. And that has a little more weight for the reader than if you just describe it. Yeah, for right. sure. Well, um, once again, I go back to the imagist dictum. You know, there's a school of poetry, imagism, uh, imagism. But uh, in, in the United States, William Carlos Williams was a big, you know, advocate of it, you know, mm -hmm. the yeah, so much depends on a, a red wheelbarrow uh, glistening with rain beside the white chickens, you know, however it goes. Um, he, his, his axiom was, no ideas but in things. Now you can overdo that. 
certainly if you get to Henry James, whom you mentioned, deeply uh, psychological uh, mm -hmm. insight, he spelled out the psychology. He would not do that. He would. He, as a narrator, would tell you mm -hmm. all the, the the characters' traits and how they got those traits in their upbringing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if William Carlos Williams were writing it, he would only show them in distilled gestures. Okay. Yeah. And Henry James' brother was a shrink. Yeah. Of course, William James so. was a pioneering psychologist. So mm -hmm. they really, you know. Once again, that trend, there is a trend toward inspection of personality and psychology in, in, as you get later in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just in America, but Americans certainly led the way with, with some of Henry James's work mm -hmm. and so on. When you mention definitive gesture, this is a, a sort of a sidetrack off of that. In French, it's called, not, not that, there's another term called acte gratuit, which means you do it for the hell of it, uh -huh. and you can't explain it. Now, Americans, that's seems to bother them. Well, gratuitous, it's just superfluous, external. Why are they, you know? Yeah, they want to know why. And in, in theater, it's drilled into your head. You uh -huh. got to know why yeah. you do every single thing. Yeah. You have to know why you pick up the pen, why right. you do. And, and I said, wait a minute, you know, because I studied French, and yeah. uh, that was my major yeah. in college. And so the act gratuit is an accepted thing. A gratuitous act means you do it because you don't know why you did it. They, they don't know why you did it. You just did it. Right. And, and a director will say to you, oh, no, 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 no. That's not right thinking. You're not thinking correctly there. You have to figure out why mm -hmm. he did it. So I'm, I just sort of, you reminded me mm -hmm. of that, which is completely different from what sure. you're talking about. Well, you might but, pick up the pen to to because your hands are otherwise shaking, you you want know, you want to hide that fact, or you, mm -hmm. you, you got a lot of energy, you want to, you got did they just want to do something, or you might want to distract the person you're talking to because yep. they might have seen something in your face and you're drawing their attention. There are a million re reasons. Um, there, there are, or there's just you pick up a pen. Yeah, <laughs> but so you're right. You can tell an awful lot, especially on stage and in a movie. The camera focuses on the person who's fussing around with right. a pen, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, of course, then there are habitual mannerisms. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we formulate opinions about people or formulate a sense of, of them through a variety of things. One of them is habitual. If I had glasses, let's say, mm -hmm. well, what kind of glasses are they? Big horn rooms or around John Lennon-esque wire mm -hmm. rims? Uh, well, what if they're always sliding down my nose and I'm always doing this? Mm -hmm. You get a sense of me. Yes. Uh, you know, like personally, Daniel Heck would not tolerate having a perpetually slipping down period. I would do, yeah, I put a strap, mm -hmm. I do something. But somebody who doesn't bother to do that, but is always doing this, mm -hmm. you get an idea from it. Yeah. Or maybe a, there's always a little piece of food in their teeth when, mm -hmm. when they're talking to some, you know, are they really listening or they think you're something else? Yeah, what's, yeah. You know, I mean, they're, these habitual mannerisms are another part of, of mm -hmm. bringing a character across. I always try to, uh, give my characters certain mannerisms that mm -hmm. are habitual. Some of them are obviously they what they define is not necessarily easily translatable. Mm -hmm. Hey, another tip though: names of characters. Yeah, that's fun too. Names is really yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. What I hate is, uh, and I'm sure most people have had this experience with an incautious author, is you've got five male characters whose names all begin with M. I, and, I, I spot Michael, that. You have Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Mitchell. Yeah. Okay. Which way was that? Yeah. I mean, which one was he? And and go back a few pages. Is he the guy who can't yeah. open the door? Is he and the other? You know, give your characters different n yes. names that don't begin with the same letter. Yeah. And yeah. I found that I was doing that in, in this book. And I yeah. said, no, wait a minute. Back up. <laughs> okay. yeah. and, I, and I had two characters with the same first name. Oh, no. Twice. Yeah. And, oh, no. And I said, no, wait a minute. Go back Our, and fix it. I've what done that, it? too, and I've literally gone back and uh, replaced. You've got to reread the replaced. book to see if it pops yeah. up someplace. Right. Or even if they're too similar, you know, yeah. Mark and Mike. Okay. I had two Ricardos <laughs> oh, no. in here, oh. and they had two Carlos. Oh, no. Because half How the characters in this book are Spanish. Yeah. So um, I had to go back and take care of that. Yeah, have the origin of the name be different nationality if you can, mm -hmm. and have the structure, like have a longer name and a shorter name, Bud versus yeah. Wentworth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you won't mix those two up. You know, well, keep Rick it different. Stout, in, in the Nero Wolf books, they have these 
pretty weird names. Yeah. But I think it helps you and it helps the the writer. Yeah. Um, to to separate people. Oh yeah. But it was frustrating when I discovered. I went, oh no. <laughs> Fortunately, it's an easy thing to fix, isn't yeah. it? But, you know, uh, there's a simple uh, truth about readers and writers, which is uh, the head of the Iowa Writers Workshop, Frank Conroy, when I was there, and he's a pretty good writer. I didn't I love him as director of the workshop, but, but uh, anyway, he did s clarify some things. He said, Listen, you can't confuse your reader. A confused reader is a lost reader. They're mm -hmm. going to disengage if they don't know what the hell you're talking about, where we are, who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, uh, you know, just uh, clarity. Uh, the absence of confusion is a great objective for a novelist. Well, now that's a, a, a wonderful topic that I hadn't thought of. Mm. There's a balance. Yeah. If you lay out too much, there's yeah. a quote in theater that's terribly important. I understand. I'm interested. Yeah. I don't. Well, excuse me. I understand, I'm not interested. Uh, I don't understand, I am interested. Right. So that y you can't lay it out too much right. or you lose them because they've yeah, figured it all out. Already. And, and the guy reading this, I felt so good because he would ask me, he said, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. What, you know, and I would say, good. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I don't want the reader to know yet. Right. What, what the, is this person going to be the good guy? I have a, a character named Humbert Dross in there. It's a very Dickensian sort of name. It's Dickensian Dross. sort of name, but it also, the word Dross yeah. is, is a, what do you call that? Not an onomatopoeia, but a, anyway. Yeah. Um, it tells you a bit about Humbert Dross, right. but he changes. Mm. He's not Dross by the end of the book. He's mm. got some pretty damn good cool. ideas. Um, but anyway... Where was I? Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you want to... Not tell him too much. You don't want to tell him too much, but you don't want to con utterly con confuse right. him either. Okay, so here's, there's a convenient way to differentiate between those two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that's simply a difference between confusion and mystification. Mm. You want to mystify somebody. Yeah. You want to confuse them. Mm -hmm. You want somebody to understand what happened and wonder why and what happens next. Okay. Or, or and you don't tell them enough, mm -hmm. so they keep turning the pages. Yeah. You know, I hate to say it. It doesn't matter what. Uh, it's not just mystery novels that you turn the pages for thrillers. Mm -hmm. You really need to. Any novelist has to write with the understanding that the reader will want to know what happens next. Yeah. And you you can give them a hint, but you can't tell them too much. Mm -hmm. You need to mystify them, but just don't confuse them. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Is this the same? Wait, is that the guy who who hit the horse? Is this the same guy who kicked that dog, or is this the nice guy who brought flowers? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to, that's stupid confusion. That's not mystifying, that's just confusing. It's, it's yeah. divorcing the reader from the flow. Mm -hmm. Their whole goal is to have the reader continuously immersed in the flow of the novels. Yeah. And uh, you think about that when you write. Yeah. You, you have to say, oh, wait a minute, will they know who Tom, you know, Bullard is? Yeah. Because uh, I haven't written him, I haven't mentioned him in 30, yeah. th 100 pages. Right. Uh, so what do I have to do to make sure that they know? And you have to do something. Well, first of all, give him a minorism. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, he's always got a cigarette, out of his, you know, a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. In fact, the whole okay. side of his face, is, his mustache is stained nicotine yellow on that side. So oh. when you see him again, he's got a distinctive, you know, some kind of a trademark appearance or, or gesture. That's a, that's a gesture good point. Thing. Okay. So that's a, that's one of the places where habitual mannerisms comes in really handy. Mm -hmm. I mean, my novels are long. Uh, I, I I think they've all been four hundred and fifty pages in print. Yeah, that's a and I don't mean to. This last novel, uh, mm -hmm. The Body Below, I was trying to write. I'm going to write this one short. Yeah, it's fairly short. I'm going to go with three hundred thousand words. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, no, I mean only only a hundred thousand words long. But I didn't. It came up with my usual hundred and fifty, which translates to mm -hmm. about four hundred fifty pages in print. Um, but, you know, you can really lose characters and threads of plot in that many pages. There's a lot of data to mm -hmm. track. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, you, there are certain reflexes you, you have that, that, you know, that you acquire. And I, I recommend in rewriting going back and thinking that way. Yeah. Um, it's a hard thing to do. I think the, the issue of mystification, uh, what, you, what you don't know, what you anticipate, what you think mm -hmm. you want to know is the hardest thing for a writer to judge. Mm 
Yeah. Because you, the writer, know what's going to happen already. You can't tell whether you've laid out suggestions of it, intimations of it, fear of it enough, or whether you've made it too explanatory. You know. um, oh, I know. I have a good example. On my seventh novel, On Brassard's Farm, as a female, it's written from a female point of view, first mm -hmm. person. And uh, this woman, it's written here in Vermont, takes place on a small dairy farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she is single, 38, and starts to feel like she would like to be with someone. She's in retreat from really, you know, all kinds of disasters. Mm -hmm. So she comes to work on this dairy farm, and there is a, the handsome young, her age, son of the farmer she works for, and there's a Native American uh, guy, uh, 20 years older, who's also there, but they become very good friends. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that happened in the, uh, that I noticed in that book is, obviously it's a love story. She starts saying, I, I, you know, I have to call my, my story a love story, but it's not the kind of love story we think of when we usually hear those words. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a fellow wrote a screenplay about it and submitted it you know, to various people. And he said, well, well, we all know who she's going to fall in love with. It's, you know, no mystery there. Well, that wasn't. But they didn't read the book enough to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to ask myself, did I, or the guy who wrote the screenplay, over-telegraph the one character? Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil readers' pleasure by telling them which of those characters. Actually, it turns out it's not who you think it's going to be. Uh -huh. and, and they, uh, yeah, I was, what I was trying to do was, here's the likely person to her, for her to fall in love with, a handsome, young, really good, nice guy, her own age, or this twenty-year-old native, twenty years older mm -hmm. Vietnam vet, you know, named Ernest Kelly, um, and I thought, and she and Ernest just hit it off, and they're just such great companions and friends from the start. Mm -hmm. And you know, so nobody considers any romantic shenanigans mm -hmm. between them. But uh, once again, I was hoping to hold the reader in some tween. Mm -hmm. Uh, some tension between, well, is she going to fall for him or him? Or mm -hmm. they get, which one is going to fall for her? Oh, I think yeah. I'm lucky in, in one way that I don't worry about that as I write. Uh -huh. And I might catch up on it yeah. later, but I just let the characters do these crazy things. And then the, the, the Micawber guy I told you about, Wilkins yeah. Micawber, he clearly falls in love with two different women. Mm -hmm. And they're both 50 years younger than he is, and he just admires them. Yeah. And so what does the, is the reader thinking, hmm, is he gonna hook up with the woman from El Salvador? Mm -hmm. Or is he gonna hook up with the, the, the woman who killed, the woman from El Salvador killed the other woman's mm -hmm. husband. So is Macabre gonna hook up with the one from Mexico whose husband was killed? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe she's just going to go yeah. back to Mexico. Is she going to hook up with, and it's a very small part of the novel, but I think for, for some readers, it will be right, you know, mm -hmm. a big question for them. And they're going to keep reading right. because he clearly is enamored mm -hmm. of both, well, both yeah. of these women. And they're both literate. Be, because they've they've come from families that were literate, so he's able to to deal with them, talk to them, and, and all yeah. that. But sometimes I'm worried that because I've got all these pseudonyms, because <laughs> Paula has to keep changing her name as she goes through oh, the country, so that the Gulf Cartel right. doesn't catch up to her. Right. So she's got three or four different names that she has to go yeah, that's by. Tricky. That's tricky. That's a hard technical challenge to overcome. Yeah. In The Body Below, I had a, a woman, uh, the sister of the uh, main, one of the main characters, who he knew her by one name, and that's how we referred to her. But mm -hmm. in fact, she had changed her name, so what everybody else calls her is, and I kept having to remind people that that was the same person, yeah. which felt cumbersome to me, but I didn't want them to start wondering who yeah. it was. After well, whenever the narrator, whenever I speak as the narrator, it's Paula. Yeah. All the way through, 100% okay. is Paula. Yeah. Uh, sometimes other characters refer to her as Paula all the way through yeah. um, because they know her. Yeah. But the people who don't have to refer to her as Rosita, mm -hmm. as Sister Kathleen, yeah. um, and I, I hope that that, yeah, it's, it's the okay. narrator is pretty consistent and refers back to, you know. But one of the things we just illuminated though was 
the uh, persistence of mystification, the mm -hmm. questions uh, that you, which one you know which one is he going to fall for? Now that may not be the central topic or mystery mm -hmm. of the book, but it, it hopefully is one of many. Mm -hmm. Because oh, yeah. in order to keep somebody, typically there are main plots and secondary plots. There might be multiple lines to each one, mm -hmm. but even on a moment by moment basis, promoting some level of uncertainty. Yeah. Is a really good thing. How's this gonna? How's this transaction come out? Oh, you have to. Out? Yeah. You know, you could have somebody waiting for the bus, and is the bus gonna come on time for him to get downtown for that important meeting? Yeah. It, leaving a reader uh, with irresolution is really good. For yeah. Propulsion. Uh, the component I call is propulsion. Yeah. It keeps the reader turning the pages to figure out what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you do want to know what happens. I don't care whether it's house nuanced a psychological saga it is, or how mm -hmm. overt the action is, where she kill him or not. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it has to be, have a number of those happening at all times. Yeah, so well, I, was, I had the courage to keep going with this because the guy reading it was wondering, well, is the sheriff gonna turn out to be just a grifter, a right. drunken grifter? Right. Or is he gonna turn around and be a major character who solves, mm -hmm. you know, who comes through? And is Humbert Dross? going to be just a bureaucrat, just, just a dumb bureaucrat? Or is he going to turn around and, and so I've got MS-13 people. Huh. Um, I, the, the Attorney General of New Hampshire wow. is the lurking villain. Right. He stays the villain, he begins the lurking villain and he stays the lurking mm. villain in, in the end and he gets his just desserts. Mm. But I won't say, Shh. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to say that. Uh, but anyway, yes, you're right. Th that's a tricky thing. Well, speaking of villains and characterization, villains are the f really fun to write. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I love my, my villains are often my favorite characters, you know. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, well, th I think one thing is, at least in my case, um, and I've heard many writers say this, you have to make them human. You can't have them just archetypal bad guys, the Satan mm -hmm. incarnate, they have horns and a little goatee, mm -hmm. they do only bad stuff. They have to have some kind of complexity that the reader might identify with. Mm -hmm. uh, some contradictions of, of character. Mm -hmm. You know, that they, they do this bad thing, but they do it with a troubled heart. No, I got to find you! <laughs> Could you just not? Nope, I got to. Um, so villains are really wonderful characters to write. How, how really bad are they going to be? Mm -hmm. You know? And, or do they transform? Is, of mm -hmm. course, another thing about character is uh, main characters, at least, need to be transformed yeah. in the course of the story. Yep. They start the story with certain kinds of um, challenges and contradictions, obstacles. Mm -hmm. they, they should have a goal. Mm -hmm. They should have wishes, a goal. They're trying to achieve, you know, they, they, they want to... Um, I don't know, they want to get a decent job and buy a house because, they, yeah, whatever. Or they want to yeah. take care of, they feed their kids, or they want to fall, um, get together with so-and-so, yeah. per, another person. They need to have something that moves them. They want to be free from f acting that way anymore. I want to change who I am. Mm -hmm. But they encounter obstacles, you know. Yeah. What, your, your job is to give them powerful enough motives mm -hmm. and powerful enough obstacles that the, the, the character has to continually rise Hmm. to meet the continually rising obstacles. And sometimes they can change, the obstacle can change the character's mind yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So, so that he can't do this, he has to do that. Yeah, and the character may end up the book not achieving any of the things they set out, but having realized, learned something about themselves which allows them to live better thereafter. There are a million ways to do it, but the, mm -hmm. the, the, accent, the rule is, not the rule, but really, you gotta have the character transformed yeah. Um, I had a wonderful conversa written conversation with a guy named Rust Hills. This is er early on, before I went to writing school, before I mm -hmm. even thought of being a writer, I was still a musician. Uh, he was the editor of Esquire magazine, and I sent him a short mm -hmm. story I'd written. It's probably a crappy story, but he wrote me a two-page letter back, Rust Hills. And he, he later put out a book called uh, Writing in General and the Short Story in Particular. Mm -hmm. Wonderful book. And he talked about this transformation of character. He said, so suppose, and he identified the kind of changes people might go through. In modern literature, modernist literature, we often find desolate characters who aren't transformed. They don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. they, they are, they're beaten down by the world, which is overwhelmingly powerful. Modern times are hard, mm -hmm. and you can't you know, beat City Hall. You can't beat modern times. 
okay, so we at last see, I'm trying to think of a famous literary example of this, but he said, yes, the character is different at the end, even if he's the same. Mm -hmm. He's the same guy. He realizes he has no hope. But what he calls it, he calls that the loss of the last chance to change. Mm -hmm. So w when he starts out the novel, he at least is aspiring to change. Ah. And, but by the end, he's totally defeated. Sounds he'll like a film him. noir. He'll never, he'll <laughs> never aspire again. You know, ah. it's been so he's okay. still the same guy, except for the loss of the last chance okay. to change. Well, I was so thinking... It's just really, really eloquent. I recommend the book. Uh, writing in general, the short story in particular, okay. does deal with the short story, but much of it applies to novels okay. as well. When I think of Elmore Leonard or Carl Hyacin, who I, I think of them a lot because in the last several years, they've been my main entertainment. Right. Uh, I can't think of, a, of, a, of the change that you're describing in, in those books so much, but the last thing you said about they have these opportunities and they have these choices and they're all bad, right. but they have to do something. So that's part of the uh, hooking the reader right. is because the reader sees these options and the reader doesn't know what they're going to do. And in this, my book, I didn't know what they were going to do. Right. I didn't know Humbert was going to do what he did yeah. and, and the, the sheriff. I didn't know how he was going to help right. The good guys. But wasn't it fun just discovering it? Yes, it, it, it yeah. was. It was fun discovering how he was going to go off his grift. Yeah. And he still has this thing that he he's a grifter. Right. <laughs> but he, he has to kind of give up that because he's faced with some bad options if yeah. he keeps doing the grift. Right. Um, so he makes his choice. Right. And the grift isn't, isn't one of them, but it's always there. It's always in his head, right. you know, looking for the, the the extra bucks. Yeah, and that's another one of those mystification things is, is he or isn't he going to be a grifter forever? Is he going to successfully change and become maybe a little more upright, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or do something good? I mean, uh, you know, of course, the tale of two cities as the, the mm. mistaken identity characters led to the guillotine mm -hmm. is a far, far greater thing I do now than I've ever done before. He's redeemed himself by sacrificing yeah. himself to the more meritorious yeah. twin of his. Well, I have a change. The, the, the Mexican woman, Margarita Lopez, she changes completely in the drive. She drives from Mexico to Vermont, to, to New Hampshire, actually. And she goes through a kind of a transformation. It's not written in the book at all. Mm -hmm. She just does. Right. And then when she comes to meet the person she's supposed to kill, she takes one look at her, has a few words, and it's a 180 degree right. turn. And I, th I think I, tears came to my eyes yeah. when I wrote that scene. Um, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Right. And it just did. You know, that little change up, that change of pace, mm -hmm. that's also a lovely, lovely device. Oftentimes, uh, you know, prose flows at a certain rhythm, certain mm -hmm. tempo, goes on and on, and a certain necessary predictability. But it's lovely when somebody, a, a novelist, suddenly sh changes up on you, mm. as long as it's believable, you know, if you can pull it off. I just was, re you know, reading about uh, Melville not so long ago. And I, you know, I've read Moby Dick probably four times and taught it a couple mm. times. And you know, it's a terrifically flawed thing, but I still get a huge kick out of it. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I mean, his biology is long, or wrong. Well, every... He's got separate chapters on biology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's digressive. <laughs> it does everything wrong. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it in modern times. But I didn't realize that you know, he has these longest chapters, long and windy by, you know, mm -hmm. windy language by modern standards. But he has one chapter that is, uh, I believe one sentence, 36 words long. Hmm. I read that today, which is a very progressive stylistic thing. So, hmm. wham, think of it, it hits you. It, yeah. it stands, you know. Uh, and of course, you can do the same thing as in, in your prose style by having paragraphs. Mm -hmm. You know, short, you know, have, yeah. you might have a long paragraph, but then bang, mm -hmm. uh, a, you know, a three word paragraph, it stands on its own. But what's going to stand out? Mm -hmm. um, my uh, uh, my mentor at Johnson State College, a, a wonderful writer and character named Tony Whedon, um, long since retired, I'm sure, but he um, he said, you know, you can almost feel. I, let me take a look at these. I'm going to take a look. Let's, uh, Hemingway would probably be better. 
you can you can see he believed you can see on the page by the amount of white space mm -hmm. and the very variations. This happens to be all dialogue, so it's a lot of open stuff. But then you go here, and there'll be chunks. And, and he said, you can, you can actually look and actually just see. He was very intuitive. And then here, this chapter begins with a big block of text, mm -hmm. long blocks of text breaking over. He said, yeah, yeah, you can, you can tell when you're, you're doing something good. You're, you know. um, and I believe that. I, you know, in general, and more open page is more accessible to the reader's eye. Mm -hmm. Don't forget Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. And if the medium is impenetrable, we often go back into 18th century, 19th century literature, and it's these big, dense blocks of narratorial prose. Mm -hmm. And they just, re they, it's re tough. they repel our eyeballs. Yeah. Literally, the medium is repelling us, not the content, if we could yeah. get through it. So I'm a big believer in, in, in keeping a page reasonably open, except for when you want to switch up and do a big block of text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, the publisher, that's up to the publisher, because I have a lot of conversation. Yeah. And how you divide up the, con how, how you make a space is mm -hmm. up, up, up to him. Is there space or is there just a paragraph? Is it whatever? Right. So, but you're right. It, uh, with um, War and Peace, Yeah. Um, you know, I would turn a page and I'd go, oh my oh, God. No. <laughs> wow! Oh, yes. <laughs> two pages <laughs> without a break, and I went, yeah. "Oh man!" <laughs> I know. I think we, we, we moderns have a harder time penetrating that kind of literature. Yeah, is it like, wonderful? Is it, was it uh, Peter Mathiason? Peter Mathiason is one of my favorite writers. Not Hyacin, but Peter Mathiason. He mm -hmm. wrote an amazing, exemplary book called At Play in the Fields of the Lord, which illuminates so much about how to write a novel. But didn't he write Far Tortuga? Far mm -hmm. Tortuga, well, it takes place in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and these, you know, piratey kind of people, you know, out there on this big open water. Mm -hmm. And the whole book is white space with, mm -hmm. you know, a short sentence, a short sentence, a short sentence, a short sentence. So it's all white. He just, the ambiance of the pages huh. is the sunlit Caribbean. Okay. It's endless, and, and the pace, it's amazing. So, we, yeah, God, there's so much to think about in writing novels, isn't there? What fun it is. Yeah, yeah. And I always get, I don't know whether to leave a double space or to put three little stars or right. what. So I just sell the hell with it. I'll let yeah. <laughs> them worry about that. Yeah, I do like se segmentation of narrative. It is a nice sometimes. Just a yeah. little mini chapter, you know, kind of almost, you know, a scene mm -hmm. segmented a bit. Well, we got 30 seconds left. Um, yeah, okay. So we, we really got into how to make character. Today, so that was good, and we did the history. So yeah. we've accomplished our lesson plan. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> well, we, lesson plans aren't accomplished unless people yeah. like it or a little bit. The best, you know, Chris. The best writing advice is ass in chair. So <laughs> sum it up. Well, so here we are, House at Pooh Corner. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>